Hi everyone, this is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today we have an amazing and ecstatic guest with us today. You will not be bored, I promise you. She's an accomplished artist, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. She had encounters with heaven and hell. She actually died multiple times or had near-death experiences. On top of that, she actually knows what it's like to experience spiritual warfare. The Lord has taught her how to battle the enemy through the name of Jesus Christ. And also she actually knows how to do the supernatural and God teaches us how to as well. And she's gonna share with us today. Tina Schmidt, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jennifer. It is such a pleasure and a great blessing to be here with you today. I can't tell you what it means to me. I'm so happy to be here in the name of Jesus and for all his glory. Thank you for having me. So Tina, you actually were not supposed to be here according to the devil. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, I guess my story starts while I was still in the womb. My um, mom, uh, I had three, uh, two, three older siblings, we're four together. And uh, my mom had horrible trouble with our dad um, with all kinds of abuse. And in all of that stress uh, that she was going through, she miscarried basically lost me i was under six months in the womb in her in her second trimester she lost me and uh i was under three pounds and um i wasn't supposed to make it i ended up being put in a hospital incubator for several months she said i was so tiny i could fit in her hand and she could see all my organs because my skin was so transparent she could see uh bones and organs through my skin that's how um uh, much of a of a fetus looking I was at that time. So I guess the enemy had wanted me not to be able to come and, and get to this point to share about Jesus, uh, but God had other plans. So Jesus said, she's mine and you were born. Let's fast forward to when you were five years old. This was the inception of your experiences with the divine with the supernatural. So could you tell us about what happened to you at the age of five years old? Yeah, so at uh, five years old, I was playing in um, the yard and we have these uh, garden stones. They're made out of like a red brick and they kind of go around, they're scallop edged and they go around the garden and around the trees and stuff. And uh, I was climbing on some things and I slipped and fell and slammed the right side of my head crashed it right in on one of those bricks. It crushed my skull in and caused uh, a very severe epidural hematoma. It's where the skull crushes in and then the brain, it can't swell out because everything's crushed in. So it began to bleed inwardly. And uh, this put uh, tremendous pressure on my um, autonomic system and my, um, my retinas for my eyes, my eye nerves. Uh, it began to starve my brain of oxygen in certain areas and so um i went into um the hospital my brother we were latchkey kids and um kind of raising ourselves most of the time and my brother called uh, my mom my mom called the ambulance and uh, the next thing i know i am at the hospital but i'm i'm hovering over the body of this little girl this is my my next recollection and i see you know, these doctors looking down and uh, I'm seeing this little girl, it's me, but I don't recognize it. I'm just observing. And then suddenly um, uh, I, I go back into my body and uh, they've had this oxygen mask or some kind of a mask over me. And I remember being repulsed by the smell of either the mask or the oxygen or whatever they were pumping in there. Um, and uh, I rejected it. And suddenly I was back out of my body again. So I'm looking down, uh, hovering around over these figures. And then, then like gravity slowly with a helium balloon, I just kind of rolled and bounced kind of like this along, went down underneath the table, the gurney, and saw the doctor's legs kind of oriented downward. And I saw the tiles of the hospital, the speckled tiles of the hospital uh, floor. And then it was like, I just disappeared down into uh, like a chute or darkness. 
in the next moment, I alighted into a dark gray uh, environment, which to me is the the second heaven. Now, uh, uh, now that I know where it was, but back then I didn't know. I was just a five year old observing, and I saw this being who looked big and monstrous, strong. He was gray, had a form, but he also had what appeared to be thousands of undulating spirits in him and around him. He had eyes, he had a face. Um, and I'm overwhelmed and in that in that environment and seeing this thing, I understood instantly that this was a creature of dominion. It had power and it had strength and it had dominion. Uh, even as a five-year-old, this was an instinctive thing that this that this thing had some kind of power. And I began to get concerned and afraid. And then somebody to my right, it could have been Jesus, it could have been an angel, began to orient me downward to look at something he was opening. So like a curtain or a, something that pulled back, I began to see the earth. And then as I looked at the earth, I began to go down towards the earth and look at towards the people. And then I began to search for my family. I was concerned about my family. And um, I spotted them. And people were like little lights, little lights that down there. And I looked and then my concern was for my family. Now, that was my last memory of that particular uh, event. But on the earth side, I had been in a coma. They had done the surgery, cut open my head, pulled out a big section of my skull, allowed the brain to swell outside the skull. And they told my mom I would probably, if I lived, I would either be a vegetable um, uh, because I didn't pass any reflex tests. You know, they poke you in the eye with a Q-tip. You don't blink. They stick your foot with a needle. Uh, you don't flinch. There's no responses here. And uh, they do a whole bunch of these other tests. And uh, so they had me on life support in a coma and it didn't look real good for, for me. And so my mom, she was a Methodist um, and she began to pray like intense when they said that they need to make a decision. So God gave her a dream that I was sitting up in bed with the bandages on my head. So she took that as a sign from God and she told the doctors, leave her on support. And then she just kept praying. And um, eventually I pulled out of it. Now, whether I was going to be blind or I was going to be, you know, mentally impaired, that was still to be seen. But what happened was my next memory was sitting up in bed and seeing my mom with, and I had bandages over uh, my head. And uh, she was overjoyed that her prayer uh, that God had granted came true. So that was um, that was the beginning of amazing things because because of this accident and the trauma of going. I was a, a you know a, we were abused as kids. Um, this had left a gateway open for the enemy, and it also provided amazing uh, training opportunity in this warfare. Um, in my life. So uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but now that I look back in retrospect, which is a great teacher, if we look back, we can see how God had been working and weaving his, his amazing power in my life, even unbeknownst to me. So now, how long were you in the coma for when you were five years old? You know, I never got the exact time span from my mom I know it was a few weeks because it took time for that brain swelling to go back down underneath the the skull and stitching me up when I got home yeah I had shaved they had shaved me off uh, completely bald and when I got home I remember as a kid looking over the dresser looking at this big Frankenstein thing with these big silver stitches staples in my head and I was like oh wow that's pretty rad kids used to think I was a boy uh, because <laughs> because my you know I had no hair I was like Buddha head right so um 
I wore a scarf, you know, to kind of cover that scar, but it used to scare kids. And, and, and so, um, it was a, it was a, an interesting, uh, challenging time. Wow. Now, how long did it feel like you were gone for? Cause I know a lot of people when they have, uh, out of body experiences or when they're with Jesus. I, as a five-year-old, there's no real comprehension of time. I, I couldn't tell you. And I would not want to speculate now as an adult to try to fit that in because that I just would I'm gonna tell you what it was, how I viewed it at that time at that age. I couldn't tell you. My mom, I'm sure it was a few weeks because my mom said it was is was a while, but I didn't ask her on the exact time frame of that. Yeah. Okay, so what about when you were 13 years old? You had another encounter, but this was something where an angel or Holy Spirit whispers something into your ear. What happened? Uh, fast forwarding then, at uh, 13 years old, um, there was someone who came into the room. I couldn't tell if it was Jesus or an angel. I had not established that relationship to recognize the heartfelt you know, relationship with the Lord at that time, somebody came in and said, uh, standing at my bedside, I turned over and I looked and he said, don't worry, everything will be okay. And, and uh, I, I did get worried because he was standing there and I didn't know this person, this being. And he said, you'll know, everything will be okay. And then uh, he had, I, I couldn't remember anymore after that. I think I blacked out. Anyway, the very next day, my mom's driving me to school. And I got a memory of this encounter. And I, mom, mom, stop the car, I said. And so she goes, what's wrong? I said, stop the car. So she pulls off off the road on the way to school. And I'm searching the, my memory, like something happened. I'm trying to remember what, what what it was and then I went oh I suddenly remembered something and I said mom somebody died and she said who who died what do you what do you mean who died and I said dad I think it's dad dad died okay so she didn't believe me she went <laughs> she goes that blankety blank that guy's going to be around to bother me the rest of my life, you know, and then she's driving off. I get home from school that day. My brothers are there. There's a quietness in the air. There's no rock and roll music. Nobody's, you know, talking. Everything's somber. I'm looking around, found out my dad did die. They found him dead. He was in a hotel room. So, um, also, you know, it, it's amazing because God had already had his hand on me and I didn't even know Jesus. Now, when I was in third grade, I would say I was maybe nine years old or 10. My stepmom had bought me my first Bible. And that was my only uh, awareness of something out there, supernatural. I read the, this kid's Bible, Marion's big book of Bible stories anyway beautiful book and I saw these pictures in it I saw these people who had these things and I asked my mom mom who's who is this God who's God she says he's the one that made everything and I'm looking through this bible so my it was my stepmom that had bought me the bible now my mom and stepmom are great friends and there's a story in there about this but anyway um that was my first inkling about there being something else supernatural out there and God had been trying to reach me through the pictures of this kid's book because it was full of animals and full of color and full of stories. And he was trying to awaken me even as a kid in third grade. So now here I am, uh, I'm 13 years old. Our dad has died. And at 14, um, I was, I actually went, started going to church after he died. I found a group of friends, started going to church. And at 14, um, I got baptized. And then I got the most amazing revelation of the Lord when he came as a, as a loving spirit to me. And it was the first time in my life that I had an awareness that somebody loved me that wasn't family and wasn't going to hurt me. There was a, a genuineness in this kind of love. It was 
it was different hadn't had this kind of love before it wasn't covered with pain and uh it was jesus and so i he broke a part of my heart you know i i all these tears came out that i was worthy somebody found me somebody made me worthy of love someone someone had faith in me it was jesus that he 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 had interest in me and so um i tried to pursue that um through church and talking about him with friends, but it, it was, he was still a concept, you know, there was something here and yet he was still some kind of an iconic concept. And there was a great distance between uh, what my mind was feeling and what my heart was feeling. And I think uh, because I had so much post-traumatic stress in growing up, there was a lot of strongholds in the way that inhibited that, that understanding and connection at that age. Yeah, it was a little rough. And then, um, but I continued to search him out. And then I think uh, the Lord wanted to give me uh, another boost. So this happened around when I was 24 years old, when my um, brother became ill. What happened then was uh, I got a call from one of his friends that he was in the hospital and he had to have surgery. So I said, okay, I'm going to go down and visit him. I grabbed some magazines, you know, thought I'd uh, cheer him up. And I go down there and he is unconscious and he looks pretty bad. Um, something not right going on there. He went in for ulcer surgery and yet um, they had an incision down on his gut that was pretty big and there was something wrong. So. I stood by his bedside and puzzled why he's not getting better. By the fourth day, they had to do a trach on him, and he went into a coma. So we're all puzzled. I stayed with him day in and day out, didn't understand. They had to have some kind of a, a rib thing to hold his gut in because he wasn't healing. So they had gone in to do this surgery on him, and on these wounds, he was going to have ulcer surgery, and he just kept bleeding. He was a bleeder, just kept bleeding out of these wounds. So um, I was puzzled and sh just broken up. We'd never had anything like this happen, you know, and he was the sweetest. My, is my, so it's my older brother who's 10 years older than, than this middle brother um, who was eight years older than I had an older sister who was about five and a half years old. So this was the one that was my middle brother, eight years older than me. And, you know, he was only 31 years old and we couldn't figure it out. So 10 days into this, an angel comes to visit me. It could have been the Lord. I didn't see him, but right here in my, my ear, he spoke to me. And he said, Tina, your brother is going to pass away on such and such date. And he gave me that date. And uh, so I didn't want to believe that. And um, days had passed. Pretty soon he was on life support. He had to have IV bags pumped into him. He had to have uh, all kinds of medical things just to keep him going. I got my mom out from another state. I called her. I said, hey, you got to come out. She came out. And um, I think right before that day, right before the night before that day was coming, that exact date, I said, mom, wh whatever you've got to say, let's go down. You got to tell him whatever you your last words to him let's get this let's get this done so we went and um I began I stood on the right side of him she was on the left side and it was just the two of us and I began to and when I held his hand to speak to him now he's in a coma room or my uh his, his eyes are closed he's got respiratory support um, he's on a machine. He's got IV bags, 11 IV bags. Don't I don't know what they were all. But anyway, um, something happens. Great power came over me, through me, and began to speak to him in a way I couldn't even repeat. I began to tell him how much he was loved, how much God loved him, how much we loved him. I began to reflect on his life. I began to examine for him all the things he went through I said you know God understands all these things you went through 
And he doesn't blame you. He loves you. And he knows that you have loved him because my brother was a Christian. He had a big tattoo, a cross on his chest, and he was a very gentle soul and he loved Jesus. So anyway, I'm ministering to him on his bedside here, telling him things I couldn't possibly know as a 24-year-old. And it's just pouring out. My mom's looking at me like, what? what? You know, and that I'm locked into this moment with my brother. And then I said, you may not understand all the things right now. And you've had so many questions in life. But when you go over to the other side and you're with Jesus, he'll answer everything for you. And I said, if you need, don't hang on here just for us. We understand. And if you want to go with Jesus, you can go with him. If you want to let go here, we understand. We're not holding you, but we want you to know we love you and support you. He squeezed my hand. He took a deep breath and exhaled. Now, all the time he'd been in the hospital, his heart rate was like 150, 180, just da -da 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 constant. And it, I watched as that monitor, just the beats went and just started. To, he had a normal heart rate. And he took a deep breath. It was like for the first time since he was in there, he could rest. I saw his body go like this. And it was peaceful. I said, okay. And my mom said what she needed to say. We left. The very next day, while I was at work, I heard the voice say, it's time. Five minutes later, I get a call at my desk. And the hospital says he, that he passed away. So I go home to get my mom. I later found out that at the hospital, they have to wait five minutes. After a person passes, they have to keep them on life support and wait for five minutes to, to declare he's gone. And that's exactly what happened. So I had heard about it the five minutes before I actually got the phone call. Now, um, we had the funeral. And uh, I, I had to organize a lot for it was a lot for a 24 year old I mean I was the youngest but I happened to be the one that had could keep it together and I um had to arrange for the funeral get friends together a little bit of family and uh it was a very small and quiet funeral got mom back home all the hooplas over and uh I was exhausted and a few days after uh when it hit me because I had been hoping for 40 days, I'd been hoping for him to live and stay alive and to live. And I was putting all my hope into him. When he passed away, I still had to keep the ball rolling. Now I had this downtime and I was exhausted. It was like everything caught up to me and I collapsed on my bed. I was really tired. I felt like I was just sinking deeper and deeper into my bed. And then something amazing happened. I was whisked up out of the physical world, like my whole being was like, and I was going through this vortex. I don't know how to explain it, but I was like going through at great speed. It was just flying and I'm seeing these lights just go past and there's this little light at the end of this vortex or this tunnel and these it's streams of light and it looks like I'm shooting through stars at warp speed we didn't have any warp speed tech technology special effects back then but that's what I was seeing just going through something at great speed and then I see this light and it comes at me like this and I hit the ground running and I'm like I don't know how I knew to run, but I'm suddenly in heaven and I can see the green pastures, the trees, the the sky, everything is alive with God. And I'm looking in the distance and I'm running like, you know, speed as fast as I can. In the distance, I see someone running towards me and he's this big. And then he goes, he's here. It's my brother. And we just came together like bam and I'm holding him and he's holding me squeezing me and I got my head against his neck and he's just swinging me around and I'm holding on and I'm filled just filled with joy like you can't believe filled to the brim with amazing amazing joy and I finally step back to look at him he is flawless there's no scars there's no cut above his eye where he was beat by our dad there's no 
cut on it, scars on his face. There's no cross tattoo on his chest anymore. There's he's whole and he's strong. He looks like a beach boy. He's got the tan. He's got beautiful hair, and he's glowing. He looks amazing, and his eyes were full of light. And we're talking, trying to get caught up with each other. And I asked him questions and we conversed and he didn't remember anything bad from earth. He didn't remember the abuse. He didn't remember anything bad. What he remembered was me speaking to him by his bedside. He remembered my words. And uh, it was very touching moment. It was so wonderful to see him. And then in the distance, I see family running towards me like running speed and they come and they put their arms around me and you know how you doing and and I'm here I am looking at my brother and I'm like yeah oh yeah uh, uh, hi yeah okay a anyway and I turned my attention to my brother because he was the one who had died what I didn't know at that time these family members had not passed away yet they were still alive but they eventually passed away before me now, so how soon? Gets, uh, huh? I was going to ask. So, how soon after did these people pass away? Years. Wow. Many, many years. So, time doesn't obviously time doesn't exist in heaven. Not like we have linear time here. Linear time here is allows us to have um, redemption. We're given this opportunity in this linear context to learn, make errors recover redeem just just along this line we call you know a linear existence it's it's a it, it doesn't exist that way in heaven it doesn't exist that way so tina let's rewind a little bit backward when you were 17 you suffocated on your pillow what happened how did you suffocate in your pillow yeah um well i had i moved away from home now, God had given me, uh, when I was 14, he had given me a gift, uh, a spiritual discern a gift of the spirit, spiritual discernment, which is one of the gifts of the spirit, to be able to discern. At 14, he wanted me to be able to discern because I had been through so much, we couldn't discern anything. We were gr growing up in a very dysfunctional environment. So he began to give me some discernment. And I moved out at 17. I got courage enough to move out got an apartment and I was working. I was still in high school and I was working and uh, kind of worked myself to exhaustion. And uh, I got ill and I didn't know how ill I was. But uh, um, what had happened was I was exhausted and fell asleep and rolled over on my stomach and suffocated face down on my pillow. How this came about is, is really weird, this next, next experience. I became cognizant, so I knew I went to sleep. I became cognizant, uh, aware. Just It's kind of like when you, you're coming out of that sweet zone, when you fall asleep and the outer world begins to plug in and then you wake up. Well, I can't, I heard a sound that sounded really strange and, I, and it, it was like, and I thought, who is playing that drum? I kept thinking a neighbor was playing a snare drum or some kind of drum. And I'm hearing this and I'm like, I can't sleep with that drum going off. Who is playing this drum? And then as I'm listening, this drum gets slower. So it goes, and just stop. So I'm thinking, finally, oh, finally that drum has stopped and I can rest. But instead of resting, what happened was I started to feel pressure. The strangest kind of pressure, there's nothing human to relate to this. This is all like a supernatural sensation. But if you could imagine every sensation in your body, every physical surface of your being shrinking, down and being compressed to the size of a golf ball 
that's what it felt like. How all of the sensation and all that I am could be compressed down tiny is beyond me. But it, it compressed. And then simultaneously, I had a strange sensation right here at the back of my head as though I was being pressured there. In the next instant, I hear this like a, you know, champagne bottle or a cork going off. And I'm popped out of the back of my head. Now I can see my hair and I'm rising up uncontrollably, rising up. I get about three or four feet going into five feet and I begin to realize, and I see that form, that form is flat. It's lifeless. It's like just flat. And I go, oh my God, I, you know, and I start pulling trying with my invisible spirit limbs to get down into that body instinctively. It's like a fish knowing he's got to get back in the water. I knew I had to get back in that body. And I kept struggling and struggling. Nothing happened. I just kept drifting up, drifting up. I was in terror by that point. Absolute horror and terror at that point. Now, here's another strange thing that happened sensation-wise. I felt like I'd hit, okay, as I rose up and I hit the ceiling, I realized something something's really wrong now, and I'm screaming terror at the top of my lungs, okay. Then, all of a sudden, I felt like I was being unspun, unfurled, like a, like a ball of, a small ball of yarn being spun out, just like that, and it happened so fast, and then, the rest of me just went with it. In the next instant, I was deposited like this, just that fast, whole, 360 degree view in what looked like hell. And the only reason I say it's hell, it's it's in this very forgotten area of hell. It is misty and dank, and I hear this howling, distant gale, like haunting sound, and the very hazy, faint light trying to break through in this dark area. And I'm perplexed and I'm puzzled. 360 degree view, how can this be? And then all of a sudden, I, I, I look over, something's caught my attention, and I see these skeletal, malformed beings coming at me, these gangly guys coming at me. One of them grabs me, and I'm looking at this thing face to face. It kind of reminds me of the Indiana Jones movie when he goes into the, the tomb for the ark. And um, my screaming bloody murder starts up again because it's pure instinctive. And I'm screaming and screaming, looking at this thing and screaming. I don't know how long I screamed there. Uh, calling out. Then all of a sudden, I was unfurled again like a ball of yarn or string going like this back into my body and it was like filling up if you could imagine your body being like an empty bottle being filled up from the toes feeling every sensation of your soul plugging into every physical cell it's it's like everything going back exactly the way it's supposed to filling me up like this, like I was water, just filling up all the way to the top of my head. In the next instant, I hear that drum again. First it's silent, and then I hear... That was my heart. This went on for about five minutes from slow to normal speed before I could even grasp what was going on. And then I'm face down and I kind of turn over, get some air on the side of my head, trying to breathe. I call my uh, boyfriend at the time and uh, he took me to the hospital. And then of course, that's when I found out I had pneumonia and it had really suffocated me. So my lungs had already been filled up. Didn't know because I'd been working so hard, I'd worked myself to the bone. And uh, I think um, my other supernatural experience around that time, I've been praising Jesus. Now, now let's that event's over. 
But another time about the supernatural during that whole time when I was in that same uh, um, apartment, um, I'd been praising the Lord and playing on my guitar. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? You know, he's here in plain view. And suddenly the presence of the Lord comes in. Now, I hadn't really known Jesus or his presence at the time. And it, it comes in as physical feeling as you can imagine when someone comes in physically you can feel it you can you know they're right there you can kind of you have a sense but this was a powerful sense and I yet I couldn't see with my eyes anything and it scared me I thought a burglar had come in so I went dropped my guitar and I could feel the presence looking at me and I went through the house looking for somebody who had come in but nobody had come in and I sat back down and there it was again, and I got scared. And because I was afraid, the presence left. Now, I know that that presence was the Lord. But the reason I was afraid is what, like John says in the scriptures, uh, uh, if you have fear, then love has not been perfected in you. And so Jesus was giving me love, but I had fear in me having been an abused kid and PTSD and living on my own. And though, you know, there was no way to recognize that precious presence when it came. So I became afraid. And so uh, that was my other uh, experience in that uh, supernatural um, around that time. Now, I just want to go back just a teeny bit, because I remember when I spoke to you previously, you said, yeah. and I know we don't want to focus on hell too much, but you mentioned that the place that you saw was the place of lost souls. What is the yes. place of lost souls? Yes. Um, because I felt as a child, I had felt abandoned. Uh, I had felt that uh, when I, because I had been abused and none of us could turn to each other. We'd all been abused. We were all under our, our dad's influence at that time. Um, and I believe he did have a, a, some kind of a dark, uh, hold over us even after he died we had a lot to overcome but uh this place of lost souls I feel was a place where uh it, it was full of death and decay and it was full of the lost who who had never come to the Lord who had never come to God who had lived an empty vacant life uh, and had never chosen to uh, awaken to the power of the Lord, and uh, it could also be a place where, where uh, you know, these fallen ones had had gone, because this was the most forlorn, empty, forgotten, um, abandoned place I, I could imagine, and that's the feeling I got when I was there, it, you know, it was a place of abandonment, and um, it isn't that God abandons us, but we abandon God. And that's the only way I can say it, that these are the souls that abandoned the Lord. And so they have no, they have no eternal life force in them. They're empty shells. And so uh, that was the feeling I got there. Now, when um, I'm going to contrast that, though, with a later visitation with my brother in heaven, where everything is perfect and full of life, and there's life everywhere, full of God's life, and every human being has God in them, and the Lord in them, and it's it's the whole uh, opposite. Amen, and that's where we want to be. We want to be on the right side. That's right. Not the lost souls. So you mentioned to me about the power of words, what we put our energy into. I'm not talking about that's new right. age energy, but you said no. that when we speak, something happens in the atmosphere, whether we speak about the diabolic or the divine. What happens yes. when we speak certain things? So what I discovered over time, and uh, especially after my having seen the, uh, the spirit world in my fourth near-death experience where I had my, um, we can get into the details of that. What I discovered is, um, when this is why Jesus warns us, he says, even your thoughts can be sinful. You have to be careful and uh, don't leave anything open to the enemy. When you speak, you are opening and closing 
dominions around you. You're opening and closing. When you praise the Lord and you praise God, you are opening the kingdom of heaven because all of the kingdom of heaven is about praising the Lord and loving and living in the Lord's light. When you curse, when you uh, talk about the enemy, when you elaborate on your sickness, I have seen in the spirit world, these vortices open and close according to your words. If you speak sickness and you continue to uh, dwell in that domain of illness in your consciousness, in your words, yeah, my back hurts, everything hurts today, this complain, complain. You are speaking into existence the very thing you're trying to get away from. And those vortices, those, those places of those forces have access because you have spoken them into existence. This is why the word is so powerful. And Jesus says, don't even lust in your heart or your mind. Whatever you think of, you, you have to be accountable for just as if you said it. And there are angels in heaven that mark not only your words, but they mark your thoughts. Everything is known to God and laid bare. And I also became aware of this during my um, my life review before the Almighty. And then we can get to that uh, later when we talk about how he, you know, opened me up like a book. But this is where I began to understand the power of uh and the responsibility we have over our words and our thoughts. There's, it's not a game, you know, we really got to take accountability. But I've seen people who, they talk about their illness, they, they, they glorify illness, they glorify their misery, and these vortices, these openings start happening up around them where they're allowing permission for the enemy to come in and do it. Why? Because they're speaking it. And this is something that we've got to get out of the body of Christ. We have to get out of it. If we're going to be kingdom, welcoming in the kingdom, if you remember, Jesus said when he was at the temple, he said, you will not never see me here again until you cry, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, we have to be ready for him. And we're not ready if we're speaking illness and sickness and disaster and disease. We're not. We have to speak, your kingdom is coming, Lord. Your will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And we have to live that. We have to live that. And then the kingdom comes. Why? Because we're doing it by faith. We're, we're walking in faith. And, and that's really what it's about. Amen. And doing that activates the supernatural. That's right. It does. It does. Amen. So tell us about, because you're full of supernatural encounters, could you please tell us about the time you went to heaven and you were shown the new earth. Oh yes, yes. So this is a um, this is an amazing, amazing thing that happened. Um, I was um, lifted up out of my bed and escorted. Now I want to explain something. When I first went to heaven to see my brother, and all the sensation of all of this passage like this was going on. It's, it's like, it's new, right? But then after you've done that a few times, that no longer becomes the phenomenon. You just kind of, you're, you're from here and then you go there. And it's, it's kind of like for the first time you take a bus ride in, into a new city, you look at everything going on. But after you've been there, you just don't notice the passage of time. You read your book, you're on the bus, you're off the bus. You don't notice all this stuff going on. So that's kind of how this visit was going to heaven, I was not necessarily aware of all the sensation of the passage through that, that, but I did become aware. We went through the front door. We went through my bedroom door, through the, the closed door, over through the, the living room door. And it's really weird because when you walk through things, you can actually feel the substance of what they're made of. So you, you go in, you can go in, out, whatever. And um, the uh, escort, my angel, took me through the door and we went into what I would call the new heaven and new earth. It was a convergence. I had seen, it, the earth was completely changed. I saw the convergence of this new heaven and new earth. And it was really like they had become one. It was the most phenomenal awareness. And I looked. And the whole landscape had changed. There were 
hills and green pastures and trees and and flowers and everything sang. I was aware everything was singing. The flowers, the flowers looked like they were sugar coated. They had a glistening essence to them, and they they had a song. And the the clouds had a song. And the atmosphere, everything had a gold tinge to it. I can't explain how I, how how how. Um, I, even if I were to talk about it, I can't bring it all here the way it was there, but it was amazing. The, the, even the, the clouds were singing glories and the flowers and the trees, everything had a song and yet all of it sounded like a symphony working together. And I'm walking into this new world and it, it was the most amazing thing. And uh, I wanted it to imprint me to imprint my being. Now I talk about imprinting. Um, it's like uh, when you, you're training horses and you imprint the baby horse, you handle that horse. So he's imprinted with you and your scent and everything. Well, God was imprinting me with heaven. He was giving me this in the full senses so I could understand and, and uh, be, uh, be imprinted in all my soul and consciousness in my body with heaven. So how did you get back? I don't know. I just know what, what happened was in the next moment after walking through these glories, uh, uh, the sound, I remember then being uplifted by the sound, just hearing the glories and just hearing the clouds sing and the angels sing, everything was in glory. And I remember then going from this self into the glory sound, into the song itself, as if I became part of that orchestration as just part of the song and the next thing I remember was losing sight of that the the being in heaven but the sounds were still there the singing and the next moment I became gently aware that I was back on my bed and I became aware of the, the sensation of being there but I could still hear the glories and I said Lord don't let me lose this. Don't let me lose this. And I kept hanging on and hanging on. And that, that heavenly glory just like, just closed ever so gently. And then I was reintroduced to the sounds of this world. And then I went into tears because it was such a, a shift. What he was doing was imprinting me. He was giving me an imprint. Now, it's like I said, when you're training a horse or an animal, you, you imprint them. You pet them. Let's say you're rehabilitating an abused dog. You begin to do things different and pet them and gently and let the dog get used to certain things. Well, God was imprinting me with heaven. He was imprinting me so that my body, mind, soul, spirit, my senses would be imprinted with this. This was his, his footprint for me to follow in a, in a journey with him that was going to continue, you know, even to this day. When in your experiences did you see Jesus? Because I know you've seen him multiple times. Yes. When did you see okay. Jesus? Yeah, so um, I think uh, he's come uh, quite a few times. Angels have come too. So these are intermittent visitations by angels and Jesus. I'm going to focus on Jesus right now. He came, sat on the edge of my bed one time. I didn't tell you this because I hadn't thought of it. Though I, I, I just remembered it. He sat on the edge of my bed and uh, I looked up at him. He had a beard, mustache, hair, like the uh, uh, kind of nice flowing hair. And I didn't understand at that time. I, I, you know, I was used to the storybooks, you know, like, like, I don't know how to explain it, but when he's come to me, he's shown himself to me in the typical storybook look that we would expect the iconic, the guy in the robe with the hair and the beard and all of that. He came in a way that was uh, acceptable to me. So, um, uh, he came and then, uh, he, he talked to me and I told him I loved him. And he said, I love you too. And then he had to go. And then another time he came and he came uh, at one point uh, to tell me something very, very important. And it was about uh, my future. And he gave a prediction to me. And um, I didn't want to hear it because I think 
it was too much for me to deal with at the time, but he gave a prophecy over me and he did it so lovingly. And I didn't believe him. I didn't want to believe him because there would be some very difficult trials up ahead. And uh, so then he came two weeks later and told me the exact same thing about my future and, and things that would go on. It was interesting because I, I got anaphylactic shock in 2009, 2010. And um, I had been working up um, in the mountains and hurt my shoulder. My shoulder wasn't getting better. I took a uh, homeopathic stuff. It didn't help. I went to the doctor. He said, well, just take a, a set of menophene and it will, um, it'll help you. It's a over the counter. I says, I don't do good on Western meds. I'm too sensitive. He says, just do it. It's fine. It's safe. So I took a little bit and I didn't take a lot, much less than the label. I didn't want to take this, but I took a little Tylenol. Uh, whoops, don't say the brand name. I had a set of menophene. <laughs> and uh, 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 what happened was um, my heart rate went up and I started having difficulty breathing. And I went back to the doctor. He said, well, it's probably H1N1. It's around the corner. Everybody's got this swine flu, this avian flu, whatever. Keep taking it. It'll help break your fever. And he wasn't listening. Um, I took not even close to what they were saying, but this pain just kept getting worse and worse. I took uh, a little bit and I went into anaphylactic shock. Now, my heart rate had been jacked up to 150, 170, 180 beats a minute. And I had even passed out. The fire department was called. Okay. And they couldn't figure it out either. They, you know, I went, uh, I had been to the hospital twice. And the first time they were checking to see if there was drugs involved. I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't take drugs. I live a very clean life. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. None of that stuff. They couldn't figure it out. Went back home. Uh, and went into anaphylactic shock and had to deal with this for several weeks. I was uh, having these heart races that never slowed down. And then I shot out my chest. There was one night, it was so unbearable and my heart's going, had been going on like this. I had a fever of 105, wouldn't break for weeks. I was burning up alive. Anyway, I shot out my chest and I'm standing there uh, at the foot of my bed and these creatures start coming at me and uh, I start kicking at them and fighting them off, you know, kicking and punching them out instinctively, just getting them off of me. And then they look and they start backing up like this and I turn and look and there's this eight foot Grim Reaper guy in a shroud with a skull face and skull arms skeleton arms and he comes over and he grabs me on the arm and I look and his the energy he's emitting this kind of chaotic buzz like being in a beehive it's just it's just really awful he touches me and I look and there's this coating like a a glove or a sleeve something put over me between him and I, and I knew that was Jesus. And so I said to him, let go of me in the name of Jesus. And he didn't let go. He was still holding on. And then I said, in the name of Jesus, let go. And I ripped my arm from him. And I stare him in the face. I got some power in Hutzpah now. And then he, he started disintegrates. He starts to back up and he goes, and kind of disappears. In the next instant, I'm looking at my body. And I'm thinking, I got to get back in there. And uh, I'm trying to wake up my husband, but I realize I can't because my body's over there. So I stand over by my body and I'm wondering how I'm going to get back in there. Now, somebody comes along from behind. Jesus pushes me or an angel pushed me back in and I went back into my body. And the next instant that I was aware of, I came out of that. My heart rate still going now and I'm still shivering and trembling from these uh from the shock and I go uh nudge my husband and we go down to the ER now at the ER uh the doctors are confused 
and they're thinking of my throat now is so swollen I can't breathe my body's all swelled up and I can't hardly talk and they're thinking about doing a trach so I can breathe and they don't they don't know what's going on and then I told my husband I says we got to pray about this this is just this has been going on it's is insane we can't keep you know we got to figure it out what's going on we start praying then I hear a voice same allergies allergies i heard i got a flash of my brother in the same position years earlier laying on the bed swollen up in a coma i hear the word allergies oh my gosh so i nudge my husband i tell him get the doctor i can hardly talk and i said whatever uh allergy allergy whatever you've got me on is hurting me and he his eyeballs got really big he looks at my chart he sees a list of things I'm already allergic to he says get her off everything I wish I could say that was the end of it but it wasn't they send me home with meds okay I throw them away because they're not doing any good and I spend the next few years recovering from all of that that shock to my system I had anaphylactic shock twice because of that and you would think that there is this automatic uh response in my brain somewhere to call out to help uh for the lord to help me but you know when you're a when you have ptsd and you've been abused and nobody calls out for help in the family you keep everything a secret you hide your wounds you don't really get in the habit of asking for help you basically deal with it and you bury it. So, so you know, even in my soul, I was not used to calling out for help. Now, I would pray to the Lord, but that's a whole lot different than calling out from the core of your soul and saying, you know, rescue me, Lord. So anyway, it, it took a while, two years for my system to come back and recover. But uh, that's when Jesus came and warned me about new things up ahead that would be a challenge. And it was a few years after that, I got cancer. Mm. Now, when I got cancer, um, Jesus had told me something. He said that there would be these challenges, but he was going to be there for me. And he also told me some things very personal. I kind of pushed those by the wayside because I don't want to believe all of, all of, it's like, I only wanted to believe the good things, not the other things, <laughs> you know, but I got cancer. And then when the cancer hit me, I, something interesting happened in that the, there was a part of me that went, oh no, I got cancer. My mom died of cancer. She died two years after my brother died. And then two, within two years after she died, my other brother died. So I had lost, you know, my dearest family people inside of just a, a few years. So now I have this diagnosis and um they do these tests and biopsies and yeah i've got cancer so um they they uh want me to go on radiation and chemo and i decided not i don't know which one it was at this time i think it was chemo they wanted me to do and i said no i'm not going to do it and um i decided to go do it the way by faith and I made some lifestyle changes. I was praying to the Lord. He was trying to draw me close to him. He was trying to draw me close to him so he could protect me. I stayed in his boundaries. But um, what I did was I just had faith. And there was a weird stirring of joy in me. I don't know how to explain it. But I knew I was facing a challenge that was the worst fear in me because my mom had died of cancer. So I knew, I said, okay, Lord, I've got this coming up and you're going to help me through it. And uh, I know that you've uh, shown, revealed to me my greatest fear. And so I'm, I'm, I believe in you, Lord. I know you're going to heal me. What and was your greatest fear? What was your greatest fear? Well, because my mom died of cancer. I always thought that that was somewhere waiting in the wings for me. And I tried, I ate right. I was, you know, I kept a squeaky clean, you know, diet and exercise and, you know, but by the time I got diagnosed, I'd kind of gotten out of shape. 
I mean, when I was younger, I stayed healthier, but I got out of shape. I was a little bit overweight, not dramatically, but uh, um, uh, in 2013, um, it, it, I, and I can't say it had anything to do with health. It had to do with my, where my walk was with the Lord. So anyway, I um, overcame that. When I got the surgery, they, um, they took all the tissues off and I went to work. I didn't miss a beat. I went right back to work and I had the drain bags that they, they have to drain out that uh, from the surgery sites. I had those attached to me. I hid them. I put a sweater over me. And I just continued working. The very next day after my surgery, I was vacuuming the floor and doing the dishes. And I was not on any painkillers. Now, pain, I would say pain is there. But um, you, you, when you're walking uh, high on the, the Lord and depending on him, you, I, I made a decision that I was not going to glorify pain and suffering, that I was going to glorify him in my walk and the strength that he gave me. So every day, I, I clung to that. and. Um, uh, I, I live by that. He would see, he was journeying me in his spirit to exercise these spiritual gifts he gives us. And until we're pressed, we don't really get the, the benefit of these spiritual gifts because we're not exercising those gifts. And I think that's what this whole thing has been about in my life journey with Jesus, you know, um, the, I, I give this example, you know, the angels are in heaven. They're always in the glory of God. They're always full of the glory of God. They're always full of his love. And so they, they're in that, but they never get the same challenge that we do down here as we're made in the image of God. But now we can draw and exercise those spiritual gifts and we can do them triumphantly and in victory and destroy the work of the enemy. So as we do this, we're destroying the very uh, realm of the enemy when we overcome. And, and I think that's why the angels marvel, as, as Peter writes in, in one of his letters. He says the angels just watch and marvel. They look on these things and think on these things that we're doing down here. So anyway, I overcame that. Uh, what happened was after the surgery, the, the pathology report came back and I was healed. They said no cancer was in the tissues. So six months had gone by uh, between the time of my diagnosis and the time of my uh, surgery. And in that six months, the biopsy showed cancer, the, the uh, x-rays, all of the tests they did showed the cancer. And then after the surgery, they look at the tissue, the cancer has disappeared. So that's a glory for the God, for God. That is glory for Jesus and his amazing healing power. Not only that, but the condition of my spirit after that surgery. There was no self-pity. There was none of this, woe is me, and oh, now look, look how I look, or whatever. There was none of that. It was just all glory of God. And I marched forward, and I never looked back. Then uh, uh, in 2015, this is when... Uh, the Lord came in his full glory. Now, I was, um, you know, I'd been cured of cancer by the Lord. We still had issues uh, going on. I lost my dog, you know, had to put her down and had to put my horse down, which was amazing. My horse was so close to me in the past 16 years. Um, I had a lot of heartbreak at that time. Plus, there was other things going on uh, around us. And in 2015, um, um, Jesus came and, or I should say, I came to him. So I went back to heaven. I don't know who took me. I think the angels took me to heaven because there was an awareness of, of some, some, someone escorting me into heaven. I got ushered right in to see Jesus on his glory throne. Now, there's nothing like this experience that I can ever compare anything to uh, on this earth. What happened was I got ushered into heaven and all of a sudden this big explosion of bright white light and color comes bursting at me, just like out of a cannon. It goes, 
just in all directions. And it's spraying out and it's not just disappearing, but now it's radiating out and there's beams of waves and beams of color. And I'm looking into this light and I see at the other end of this light is Jesus. Jesus, the glorified King, who Jesus is and was even before like he ever came to earth. He was the creator. He's the source. And I saw this power just blowing towards me, 360 degree um, uh, range all around him. Creative power, the source of all power, just beaming off of him, sourcing from him, radiating out of his very being. And the thousands of millions of colors we can't even perceive with our physical eyes. I was seeing colors and radiations that we can't even perceive here coming off of him as though with every breath he breathed, they pulsed because he was the source of all breath and life. I'm looking, he has this bluish robe, uh, dark blue and the white sleeves, but it's it's organic. It's not like it's dead material. It's alive and it's alive with him. It's radiating life off of him and off of this robe. And he's sitting on what looks like a cloud throne. There's clouds around and, and he's like on this throne and this life power, pulsing power of the universe, of all universes, of all heavens is sourced in him. And I know this, I'm, I'm in this, my spirit, in him, with him, watching this, comes at me. I'm getting in the draft of it. Just pours thousands of beams of light and power coming at me. All knowledge, all wisdom is in him. All power, all glory, all sovereignty, everything is that is pouring out. All majesty is pouring out from him through these beaming rays. Every question I have, it's like my soul was opened up. Every question I had was answered. Every question I had, every question I will have, every question I ever had is answered in those rays, in his presence, in that power, wisdom, knowledge coming off of him. I'm stuck in its draft and I'm looking up and then I see his face. His face is white like the sun, glory white, whiter, just bright, bright. And then I see his, I can barely make out his eyes, his nose, his mouth, a little bit of the beard. I can see through that blazing light. It'd be like if you were staring into the center of the sun, but I wasn't getting my eyeballs burned out like we do here, you know? And uh, I could see the 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 eyes and and the the face but it's it's like all this glory is also pouring out of him then i see i'm looking at his face and then i look above it and i see this crown like a a, a corona or a, a crown around his head of beaming gold rays of gold light just living light just <laughs> And as I look at it, you know, like I, I've said this, that it, they say in the Bible, he wears a crown of many crowns because they think of him as wearing the crowns of the nation. He's going to rule all nations. But this crown was like, this is the crowns of all the heavens. He was the king of all the heavens in the highest heavens. It was like just gold in these amazing layers, just I can't explain it, firing off of his head. And then as I'm staring, so I went from his robe, looking at his face up to his crown and my eyes go up and then I see this rainbow. So we've got all this light radiating in 360 degrees, beaming colors and bright glory. And then I see this light go over his head like this. And it is rainbow in the other direction, a rainbow. So I'm I'm just stunned. I couldn't get it couldn't get more glorious, and suddenly it gets more glorious. It was just the most amazing thing. And uh, every question I had was answered. And I could have stayed there a million years, and it never would have been enough time in that glory. It was like um, 
his love pouring out to me, my love uh, just being, I, I can't explain it. It was my love to him, his love to me, but so powerful. Then what happened is I felt as though he did this, like he reached. And over my head, I feel the sensation of his finger going like this over me. Like he's drawing a rainbow over my head or doing some kind of arc over my head. And suddenly it unzips all this power, all this love, this energy, this thick, powerful, molasses-like energy, just spirit pouring over me slowly and like liquid, but slow and very thick. I, there's no substance here on earth that I can even possibly compare it to, except molasses or honey, but that's thin, you know, it's, this is thick, it's coming out in this thick, and it is, it goes through my head, through my soul, through my spirit, and I'm aware of this, the physical part, the soulish part, the spirit part, all going, and it's all pouring through my bones, my nerves, my ligaments, my tendons, my organs, like I'm uh, a glass being filled up again, and it goes pouring through all the way down my organs, down my bones, down into my feet, and then it is the way it, it, it he wanted me to know every nuance of this. He could have poured it on fast. He poured it on very slow. He wanted me to be aware and cognizant of it. This was love in its purest form. His love, his undiluted, perfect, beautiful, uh, pristine love that he has. And he poured it through me. And that love turned to joy, a joy I had never experienced. Every bit of me was just bubbling with this joy, and then it turned to bliss. And it was all the problems I had on earth didn't matter. All the suffering didn't matter. All of I had all my questions answered, but they didn't matter now. It didn't matter because I was in the presence, and I was in that perfection in him. And I'm basking in this. Now, keep in mind, these radiating light beams and light is still blasting towards me, but it's nothing compared to the source of what I was looking at. It was, there was nothing like this ever. Phenomenal. I'm getting hit with these rays of power and glory and love just pouring through me. It turned to bliss. So he imprinted me again with him. And uh, I don't remember how I got back, not very clearly. I do remember, however, having tears upon my awakening, tears. Um, I wish I could have stayed there forever. And, uh, but, but he gave me something. So I was able to face the trials that were to come uh, in the next few years. Now, that was 2015. And then in 2000. Uh, 16 we moved into this house and that's when a lot of trouble happened we there were things here that had lived here this had been the territory of the enemy which we didn't know it used to be an airbnb and it had a lot of um uh demonic activity there was thumps going on you know we you know we it wasn't raccoons okay and it wasn't squirrels running along the roof this was there was a presence here and i had gotten ill again and I was puzzled, but uh, there were supernatural forces that were wanting to keep this territory. And uh, then doctors tried to put me on uh, some digestive medication. I had migraines. They started to put me on uh, some migraine medication for the first time. I'd never had it before I was dealing with them. But then um, something happened. And that's, I think Jesus had blessed me in 2015. He was preparing me for this warfare that was coming up. And so uh, what happened was the, um, uh, the enemy began to take advantage of my weakened state because uh, there was a lot going on that needed to be taken care of. And I, we didn't know that this place was, I don't want to say haunted, but it had, it was the domain of the enemy. and so. Um, my health started to go down and, uh, I had been in the ER from 2017 to 2000, 
18, I'd been in the ER eight times. And uh, it was uh, all due to the different reactions to medications and things like that. And uh, I was never very good on Western meds, but uh, even the holistic medicine wasn't helping. So there was a, a power here that we hadn't addressed. We didn't realize how much the enemy had inundated us here. And then um, in 2019, uh, uh, I had what they call like a, an internal fire, a cascade effect where your system starts to shut down. I got brain damage. They gave me a medication and it, it worked, it, it destroyed part of my brain, got down into, because you know, the medications nowadays, they work on your DNA. They're down onto this DNA level and it's very, very dangerous. You know, people get all kinds of side effects, which they try to bury under the carpet. But anyway, this medication went down into my, uh, it had a cascade effect. My system just couldn't take anymore. And it burned down through my spinal cord down into my nervous system and affected all of my nervous systems and my brain. I had severe uh, tinnitus. It sounded like a roaring train in both ears, plus these other kinds of, like a nine alarm system, uh, the fire department, just constant tinnitus going off. And uh, I had a, a very bad system meltdown. So um, I got taken to the ER. I was there for 32 hours and I had a, a heart attack. Then they put me in the hospital for 10 days. But in that ER, I was fighting for my life. And uh, there was a, um, I, my heart rate had been going up for weeks and it was 150, 170 again. And then uh, it, I felt the pain shoot out so bad through my chest and, and I knew I was having a heart attack. So I got up out of the hospital bed. This is at the, at the ER. And I said, I'm having a heart attack. I was supposed to be watched. There was, somebody had left, I guess it was late at night. And I fell forward flat on my chest. And, um, I think there was a bad thing that happened of something left like a, a, a you know your heart has a pericardium around it a pericardium is a protective casing around it well I also believe your spiritual heart has a casing of protection around it and this thing shot out and it rolled off to the side and I blacked out and the next instant I woke up I was on my back and I had these ER attendants around me and told they told me you gave us quite a scare and they, they doctored me up and they got me out of there and into a hospital where I was for 10 days fighting for my life. My system had shut down. So I was having all these system failures right and left. And um, during that time, uh, the enemy would come and try to destroy me and take me out of my body. Now, let me tell you what this damage felt like. It felt like thousands of uh, searing pain needles or you know very painful shoot because my nerves were inflamed they were all inflamed and they were uh i had the inflammation here in the brain from a reaction so all of my nerves were pretty much shot and uh painful they were firing off 24 hours a day so anyway in the hospital the enemy kept trying to take me the doctors are pumping me up with meds that are trying to kill me they don't they don't know that's trying it's hurting me but i couldn't do well on them so um, I said, that's it. I've, I've had it. When they would give me the meds and I'd stick them in the corner of my mouth, pretend I took them, and then I'd spit them out. And I told my husband, I'm out of here. You get me home, I'll die at home. I want to die at home. I don't want to die here. So we, we got me home. And uh, that the most amazing thing began to happen. The Lord began to work with me in the most amazing ways. But I, you know, I had to be broken down so much that he became the only thing, the only hope, the only, the only, only, only thing left. So my brain wasn't functioning well. My body wasn't functioning well. The only thing left that he was working with was my spirit. He had, you know, pretty much uh, tried to help me through it all. And, and things had begun to shut down, but he was there and he showed up again and he showed up again. He, he, in the in this when I got home, 
And uh, I, I think it took me a good three years to come out of this. It was at least a year and a half where I could get around without searing pain. But um, in two years, I mean, the and keep in mind the tinnitus was still firing off, very painful, 24 hours a day. But he would come. One time he came and he put his arms around me gently from behind. He bent over and he whispered the kindest, sweetest things to me. And then he was leading me. He wanted me to awaken to him. He wanted me to awaken to him, you know, to come and awaken to him and to call on him. So that's when I really began this deep and most profound relationship that I put everything aside and depended on him. And then when I started doing that, the demons got weaker and weaker and weaker. And one day um, they, they had their comeuppance because um, I went to war with them. Now, keep in mind, physically, I'm still flat on my back. What happened was in the spirit, the Holy Spirit uh, helped me and Jesus helped me. He's in me. And um, uh, he, he kept taking, Jesus kept all that day saying, I love you. I love you, Tina. He, I kept hearing his voice tell me he loves me. And I went to the doctors for my appointment. And then um, he, uh, at night, I had warfare like you wouldn't believe. I, I was, I got up and I began to fight these demons. I was pulling them out. They were coming at me and I would grab them and smash them. I had a weapon in my hand and I was smashing them and smashing them and their heads exploded into dust. It went boom and just like dust everywhere and I'm crushing their bones and crushing them and they they start running and screaming and I'm grabbing and crushing them yet in my flesh I'm still weak and flat on my back go figure so anyway what happened is I got taken to Psalm 18 Psalm 18 is the most powerful psalm you think Psalm 91 is powerful check out Psalm 18 where David writes the cords of death were around me, but I called out to you, Lord, and you rescued me. He also says, uh, the enemy ran. He says, I pursued my enemies. I did not turn back. I pursued them, and they ran from me. He says, I pounded them in the street. They were destroyed like dust, and I, they poured out the street like mud. And I went, oh, my gosh, I'm living that scripture. King David knew warfare, and he knew spiritual warfare, and he wrote that psalm the very day he had gotten into a major war and won against three different armies. It was amazing. So he knew, and I realized how powerful those scriptures were, and I said, I am living through these scriptures, these psalms, and I also began to write psalms. I began to write songs for the Lord, and he began to manifest through these songs. It's, it's been an amazing, amazing victory for him. Now, Tina, this is so beautiful, but I want you to go a little bit back because when you sure. said something, I'm sure there were some people who were wondering, why does she say this one thing? When you mentioned okay. when you moved into your home, it was an Airbnb. There's some yeah. people who are watching it who doesn't understand, who don't understand why you mentioned. I know why, but could you just emphasize why sure. that was an important piece of the testimony? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Okay, so uh, the Airbnb was a, it, it, this house was, is a, it's a nice house. It's used as a rental place before. People, it's a vacation home, temporary. They call it a short lease where people would come in, they vacation and they go about their business. But what happens is people do things in, in ho hotels or away from home, doing things in places they may not do at home. And so what happened is the enemy finds these areas, scopes them out, and takes control of them. Now, what I, what I want, I don't want to frighten people, but remember that what Jesus said, that um, uh, he brought us the kingdom of heaven. It says he brings, he, you know, the kingdom of heaven is, is uh, and men try to take hold of it aggressively. They try to stop the coming of the kingdom here. And we as Christians, we enter a blood contract covenant with Jesus and the Father, and we become part of his kingdom citizenship. So when we're here, we are moving in the kingdom into here. We're moving the kingdom to earth. That's why it says your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
So when we as Christians moved in here, the enemy was trying to take possession of this territory that they once operated in. And I was slow on the learning curve, finally got it. And the thing is, though, instead of just praying in the wings for Jesus to do something about it, when my life finally got pushed to that edge, I had to do something and fight back. And that was the awakening of the power of the Holy Spirit. And he gave me that. It says in uh, Jeremiah 23, 29, I give you the fire of the word and a hammer that can crush and destroy the rocks into pieces. So he was talking to me through that scripture. And I began to literally crush these demons in the spirit world. And this is the very knowledge and wisdom that the enemy had tried to stop me from before I was even born. Now, you know how runners, they used to think, uh, you know, the six minute mile could never be broken. Okay, suddenly someone breaks that record. And then uh, more people can break that record now. They used to think, you know, you couldn't break that six minute mile. Then you couldn't break the record of the five minute mile. Oh, somebody broke it. Now a whole bunch of people are. See, it, it, it's the limitation is in our paradigms. It isn't in God. Jesus says, I give you authority over all, all the powers of the enemy to crush the snakes and scorpions and the great lion. Okay, so that's what ends up happening when you're fighting in spiritual warfare. It's an engagement. It's an engagement in the warfare. And, and what I discovered is even though in the physical, I could be flat on my back in the spirit world. I was carrying out his word. I was carrying out his, his, um, his power that he gives us. And so we speak it. We, we have to follow through in the speaking of these powerful words that he gives us. Now, everybody has a different assignment. Not everybody's got my assignment nor, or your assignment. Everybody has their assignment that they're supposed to do. Mine is to bring the power, the glory, the victory of Jesus and his coming kingdom here and to make way for the king when we won this territory back from the enemy this is kingdom territory you know we're bringing that kingdom here and i you know i got the sin out of my life it's amazing when you you're blind like i said before i got my whole life revealed before my eyes and i began to see uh, uh what needed to be taken care of in that sense but anyway it's it's been a journey I really like how you mentioned in Psalm 18, how when David was in a battle, he pursued the enemy much right. as you pursued it. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't understand that we're not supposed to be pursuing the devil when things, when, when he's not attacking us because you're looking for trouble. But when you're right. in those battles, you pursue the enemy and like you did that and you crushed the enemy with the power of the Holy Ghost. So you had that power in you. I, I just like how. And he kept telling me, he said again, because I, at first when I was fighting him, I, it was like no effect. And the Holy Spirit was like, again, do it again. And I went, wow. boom, finally. And that stays, see, that's an education. You get that in the spirit, then that stays with you. Um, I do want to say though, however, uh, we're not to engage the enemy on this level unless you are walking. Right in the Lord. You can put yourself out there and be totally, totally undone. If you go out there, you cannot go out before the Lord. You don't go and run out of his protection in a way. You don't do that. This, I had no idea that I was going to do this one. I didn't plan on anything. This was all Holy Spirit and Jesus activity. This is not something I consciously pursued at all. What I, I did was I waited, I'm flat on my back and all I could do is stay, draw close to him, be close to him, rebuke the enemy, read scriptures and hang on to Jesus and establish my relationship with him. What happens in that spiritual realm is what he's assigned me in spirit. It doesn't mean that um, it's all handled exactly the same way with every person, but this is what he showed me and, and what was instructed to me. And if I was not walking with the Lord and I was not, uh, I wouldn't have been protected. Believe me, I'd have been devoured. It was like that time. I don't, I don't know if we have time, but I was telling you about uh, that person who came to do body work on me and the angels. Did I tell you? Um, I think so. Please tell it. 
All right. So this is when, um, this was years ago at the other house we lived in and somebody um, was coming over to do some kind of body work, you know, uh, like massage and get all the kinks out. <clears throat> then they, they had the little work table. Anyway, this person, uh, I laid down on the table and uh, I prayed, God, because I had a lot of pain in my body back then. I still had a lot of PTSD a trauma locked up in my muscles. And, and this was before the brain injury and all of that. God, I said, please help me. I just, I was face down on that work massage table. And I said, please help me. I don't know what's wrong. I need help. And that's what I prayed. So this guy starts working on me. And uh, he starts putting his hands where he's not supposed to. Okay. And suddenly he got close and his hands kind of get too close and he pulls back screaming he runs into the other room then he comes back out tries again didn't work i he says turn over i turn over and i'm thinking something's going on here it that that's not right you know he shouldn't be getting that close to those parts <laughs> and um so he tries the third time he doesn't even get a foot from me and he shrieks back yelling and he's grabbing at his back and his arms and he runs into the other room. And then he comes back at me and his eyes are really big. And he said, every time I try to come near you, he's trembling now. He's not talking nice. He's trembling. He says, every time I try to come near you, I feel like somebody's protecting you and I'm getting stabbed with swords. Wow. And he said this to me. Now, it didn't dawn on me. God put a block. I just totally didn't get it. I went, oh. And he says, I have to go. He was so terrified, you know. The next day he came and apologized. He knocked on my door and he says, I'm sorry. He says, something happened in there. And he says, all I can say is God must be with you. God must be with you. He said, I'm sorry. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Do I get my money back? You didn't do any body work on me. I mean, I'm like, I'm still on this earthly level going, what happened? You know, later, I realized when I read the Psalm 91, he will, his angels will encamp, encamp about you and protect you for the, he protects the righteous. Now, if there had been any kind of, um, mm, let's say any kind of bad sexual sin in me or something that would have not been offended by that kind of thing the angels wouldn't protect me because i would have been in agreement mm -hmm. you know i would have been in agreement to permit that i didn't though because i wasn't even on that level with this person i was on a whole other level in the spirit of the lord and you know he protects you so um this is why i also say it's very important what you think what you believe and what you speak because you allow certain things into your life where you can block them out according to your word and your paradigm and the and that what what you live in as your 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 world you know if if you believe in the kingdom and you believe in jesus then you've got to walk that kingdom and you've got to walk that belief you can't just pretend it's just words and then do the opposite that's right that's right now i want to touch on really quickly and you mentioned it earlier but i don't think we mentioned it um fully how jesus showed you your life in a book in a glance oh yes so okay um i'll do that jesus has come to me in different ways he's come to me um after that glory experience and now we're fast forwarding here 2019 2020 2021 22 he's come a number of times each time he comes a little bit different um, he's tried to establish a relationship with me that would put me at ease. He knew my suffering in the recovery of this brain injury, um, my nervous system and everything. Uh, he came, sometimes he's come as a brother. He looked very casual. Sometimes he's come looking like Jesus, the savior. He's come, put his arms around me. He's come other times to talk to me and console me. Other times he's come to correct me. And I, he, he, he's, he broke me out of this uh, religious paradigm of what I, I think he's supposed to look like, you know, 
And, and so what I find interesting is I was reading the scripture and I was reading about Isaiah and how Isaiah had would collapse and be in the glory of the Lord. And, you know, the, the, he saw the angels and they're all holy, holy, holy. And I said, Lord, what is holiness? You know, you come in here talking to me so kindly and nicely, and I've seen him on his throne. I've seen that, but what is holiness? What is this holy, holy, you know, angels are singing holiness, holy is the Lord. And I didn't know. So I asked him one night and the next day in the day, this wasn't nighttime. He comes in in his full almighty glory of uh, the almighty. This, this power that came in as the majesty of the Lord was and I wasn't in spirit. I'm in the flesh. This is happening in flesh. Okay. He comes in. Immediately what happens is my entire being collapses. Laid out like a bearskin rug. Just goes flat uncontrollably in submission to this omniscient king of kings. I go flat and my soul is opened up filleted open like a book i it just was like like a fan of a book just laid open everything that i am my emotions my my thoughts my history my every everything i've been through everything in my life all the consciousness that i am including my body felt like it was filleted open like this all the pages just laid bare. And there's a scripture that says, you know, um, in Daniel, they talk about the judgment where the, the seats are taken and the books are opened. The books are brought out and the books are opened. And there's another part that says, and everything is laid bare before the Lord. So he opens me up like a book. And on every page of the book is all these events in my life. I get this entire life review good bad ugly wonderful and uh, everything and it was in that i could see the cause and effect of my life i could see decisions effects decisions effects he's a, like in the garden from the very beginning you choose this then this happens you choose that then that happens very simple but i got to see the whole thing in my life I was filleted out and there's no feeling like this when being put in a trillion pieces, you know, a thousand pages, just filleted open. There's no sensation to ever explain this. And to me, it's kind of like the opposite of standing in the glory of Jesus, getting hit with all this love. Now you're both, now you're in the judgment. And it was amazing because I could see everything in my life that ever happened. And this happened. It's all encompassing my mind, my body, my spirit, my soul, my flesh was in it, experiencing it in seconds. This thing just was like a laid open and then he fanned through the pages. And then he takes me, my soul, everything and goes and just seals it back up like closing that book up perfect. Here, hands it back. And all of a sudden, I'm like, put back, thankful, thankful that I'm back in one piece where I was thousand pieces before. I am so thankful and so awed by this power that I, I can't explain it. I cannot explain it. And I have this reverential fear of God that I never had before. It, it's not like a terror fear, but it is an awe. And it is a, it, it just is. You, you just, you know, I can never believe these people who say, I got to go right in before the throne of God and tell my peace of mind or whatever. I, I just cannot see that. This is like God. And you, and I got that judgment. It was like, and I could see everything and I could now put the pieces of my life back together. So he did this for me, not to terrify me. He was, he's, he's an economist. He often does many things at once in one event. And he was showing me this is the holiness that I have, that I, I am holy and you are the soul I made. This is your life. But what he also did was show me how tender and how loving he held me. He held me with the same tenderness while I'm going through all of this life review coming unglued. 
He is holding me so nothing breaks, nothing gets harmed, and his love is still pouring. How you can feel that love and tenderness at the same time, everything you've done is being laid bare and raw, and you can see the judgment. You can know he was right in his judgment on everything he did. Everything revealed to me, you know at the core of your being, was righteous by him. Everything. And so it was the most eye-opening, you know, now, you know, when I, when I go before the throne, um, praising and worshiping, and if there's admittance, the angels, you know, I'm, I'm waiting, hiding in the wings, and I'm waiting for them to, okay, it's okay now, come, come, he's, he'll, he'll talk with you, or he'll receive you. This is a whole different thing than Jesus coming as a brother, loving on me. This is another part of him that we don't see very often, but um, it's there. And then there's that warrior Jesus too that we didn't talk about. Wow. Okay, so all these different perspectives of how you see Jesus, the paintings behind you, are those paintings of how you saw Jesus in different ways? Yeah. Um, uh, when I was in med school, um, I think, I don't, I don't know if we talked about this, but when I was in med school back in 2005, 2006, and before, um, I had uh, an experience with Jesus where my heart rate had dropped really low. I'd been working really hard and going to school and working full time. And my uh, energy level had dropped and my heart started going down into the 40s. And uh, I prayed for six weeks for a miracle. Nothing happened until that seventh week when I got an epiphany about my prayers and how to pray and what to pray. And I got out of my uh, paradigm of illness and began to praise him and worship him in a way much different. I began to rise up in the spirit and, and uh, pray from that level. And I got my miracle. And in that time, uh, Jesus came. First, there was this big, bright red light that had come into the room and it was pulsing. It was alive. It was just be beaming with life, so powerful in its concentrated form that when I looked at the light, it blotted everything out in the room. And in that pulsing light, it was kind of red and orange and pinkish and swirling, but powerful. And then Jesus emerged and he shoved that light down into my chest. And then it went into me here and it filled me and all the way down to my toes. And my heart rate went from the 40s on up to 70 in the mid 70s and uh i recovered from that it was miraculous and i had strength all the way through from that point on um but he looked you know this is the the one that you see over my shoulder right there he looked um like this coming out of that red light so i i did this picture right after the event it was fresh in my mind and so i painted this uh picture of the lord and I wanted to capture his essence and what he, how he looked to me and the kindness. There's something about Jesus, no matter what, whether he's coming in as a warrior or a, 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 a healer or a brother or whatever, there's a kindness. He says, you will know me by my spirit. He didn't say, you'll know me by my appearance. He says, you'll know me by, by my spirit. And so he's trying to work with me knowing him by spirit, not by his appearances. So sometimes he doesn't come in looking identically the same way because he doesn't want me getting transfixed in a religious paradigm or, or an iconic paradigm. Um, then this one is one where when I was flat on my back, uh, 2020, still recovering, still getting well, he began to teach me and I got into one of these hellish realms um, looking around perplexed again what to do and an angel said um uh called out and he said only the son of god only the son of god well i'm a deer in the headlights yeah okay only the son of god didn't get it again later uh and i went oh yeah jesus help me okay okay i get it now call out to the lord jesus help me then the lord came and he carried me out of the darkness he set me down gently, and he was a warrior this time. So this is a picture of what he looked like as a warrior, okay? He had armor, and he had built, he was built up, like, better than any superhero we have here, you know? And uh, he, he, he set me down, and, and he turned, and I could see his arms, and he had X's 
like tattoos, little X's all across. And it made me think of those fighter pilots in World War II, you know, whenever they would uh, bomb the enemy and knock an airplane down, they'd put a little X or a little symbol on the side of their aircraft. So he knew that that's what I would think of. He had put these X's, these little hit marks, and I got it. He was telling me, these are the hits I took. This is what I did. These are the enemies I've destroyed to save you, to help you. These were all the, the, the hits I took for you. So when he, we hear about him saving us from sin on the cross, he did more than that. We just, we, it's unfathomable all the things that Jesus did for us. So I see these little X's and he's letting me have the time to examine this on his arms. He knows I'm an artist. He knows. And he lets me, and then I see the scars, you know, on his arm. He is the most, he is the superhero of all heroes. He is the most amazing, amazing God and Lord of all. And um, here's another one. This is when he came to me like a brother. This is him. And I thought, Jesus, you only, you don't even look 30 years old. This was him and his, how, you know, he's a kid to me, you know, like my college students. He's like a sweet kid. And he came to me to um, show me himself as, as someone I could relate to. And I'm telling you, the tenderness and the, the gentleness and yet the omniscient power of this God that loves us. There are no words to describe. Um, he's the hero of all heroes, the God of all gods. He loves us so much, so much. And uh, that 2009 experience of having that complete systemic meltdown, what it did was put me on that battlefield and break off. I either had to go 100% in, into Jesus and lean on him and his word and the power he gave us, or I was going to die. And this is where I began to really understand our thoughts, our things. If I were to have one slight doubt about my survival, my system began to shut down my heart rate began to stop I stopped breathing and I had to struggle to like to come back I, okay I'm not going there if I heard something on tv that was negative my system responded and then God began to show me the nature of the soul he began to teach me through all of this that what we watch is important what we hear what we surround ourselves with we need to create that divine atmosphere of the lord if we want jesus to walk into our heart walk into our room and sup and dine with us if we want it we have to change the atmosphere because we have to make it ready for the king and a lot of times we don't do that we go to church on one hand and we're watching bad movies or yelling at people on the other it, it's a it's a you got to I told him, I said, Lord, when you put me back together, I don't want any of that other stuff. I want you to rebuild me. And believe me, when he, I began to get stronger, the enemy tried to come in and snap some pieces back into me. And I said, no way. Well, I just want to promote you a little bit because um, the picture to your right, I believe on your right shoulder of Jesus. <laughs> well, that one, I'm going to get to that one. But those two okay. are my personal favorite. I know everyone has their own favorites, but the picture of Jesus over your right shoulder is the closest I've seen ever of how I saw Jesus when I saw him in authority and how we even confirmed with each other, how I told her how, when I saw Jesus, he was very masculine. That's it. He was very yeah. masculine, very masculine. And his face was beautiful. Like that, that's the closest I had gotten. And the one that's, the picture. that's it. Yeah. That's yeah, it. That's the one when he was a warrior and his hair was blowing around like he'd uh -huh. been to battle. He wanted me to know that. He didn't come looking all <laughs> polished walking out of a church. You know, he came looking like I've been on the battlefield. Yeah, and yeah for sure. Yep. Yeah. So and that's he how looked I like saw this to you too, didn't he? Yeah. He looked a lot like that. And I can, I am being completely honest. That's my favorite because out of all the pictures I've seen, that's how the closest that I've seen Jesus is how you drew him. And then the one next to it, it just touched my heart. Even when my husband saw it, it touched him too. He said, that's my favorite. That's my, because it's something in it. It's an anointing in that picture where it screams faith because I always go back to that yeah. verse and the, but the story of the Roman soldier who had faith that Jesus said he hadn't seen a faith in all the land, except the faith of that soldier. Could you just tell us a little bit about that one, Tina, please? Cause I really love that one. Yeah. So, um, you know, Jesus was, Jesus was often 
uh, breaking down paradigms and strongholds. And um, the, this Roman soldier had a sick servant that he said was a lot like his son, like a son to him. And he comes over to Jesus. Now, it, we, we tend to take these things for granted, but you have to put yourself back in the time when Jesus was in a very closed, very fixed society, okay? And they were being uh, run by what they felt was their enemies, the Romans, okay? So here Jesus is, he's with his disciples and his followers, and this Roman guy comes in and says something like, uh, I've got a, a servant who's sick, uh, and and he, he needs your healing power, whatever, and Jesus says, I'll go with you, and the guy says, no, 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 I don't want to bother you, just, just give the word, and he'll be healed, I know it, and Jesus looks around at everybody else, his own people who don't have that faith, and he says, do you see this man here, never have I seen this kind of faith in all of Israel, and then he turns to the guy and says, he's, he's healed, the guy says, hey, I give orders to people, so I know that they're going to, they're going to do what I tell them to do, okay, I'm a man who gives orders, so if you say it's going to be healed, it'll be done, so it was interesting, again, like I said, Jesus meets us where we're at. This guy, he met this guy right where he was at. The man knew about the chain of command and, and Jesus healed him. So in my painting of, of that encounter, if I were to just do it the way the movies do, where they just sit there and talk to each other, you wouldn't understand what, what was going on in that conversation. But here, I've got Jesus in the Roman in conversation, Jesus and him are clasping hands. The room is looking into his eyes like, thank you, my friend, thank you. And Jesus is loving him back. And I think that this is, and in the background are the disciples kind of scratching their heads. This is kind of uh, outside the box, outside the religious paradigm. Jesus is reaching people from all over. And so this, this is an act of faith on both sides. You know, Jesus uh, is healing this man's servant. This man has faith in the Lord. He understands the chain of command. If he understands the chain of command, then we should understand the chain of command and the power of his word. We should just take it for And If Jesus says you have authority, then you have authority, you know, and uh, if, if, uh, and that's how I looked at it with my healing. I might not have been healed instantly. I was healed in phases. There would be times nothing showed any sign of my healing, but I kept saying, I know you've healed me, Lord. And there would be times when he would heal me in steps that I could feel his power. He'd come in and there would be great power and light coming in. And I'd hear this and feel this power moving through my brain, like electromagnetic, putting, healing my neuro, neuro systems and healing my brain. I could feel it. And he would do this in phases. And then suddenly I would have more coordination back or I would walk better or I'd have better peace of mind. And it, he was doing this and building my faith and building my my um, my fortitude and my faith at the same time. So it was causing me to walk closer and closer and closer. And so that kind of reminds me of the walk and the journey we're on. We have to get outside of our own comfort zone and our paradigm and embrace what he says. If he he tells that centurion and that centurion respects law and word uh, commands, if Jesus says you're healed, then you're healed. Your body may not feel it, but you, you will, if you live by that, it will happen. I heard a voice tell me in April of 2019, when I was um, still very ill, it said, do not underestimate the power of complete healing. This voice told me. It didn't say, hey, guess what? I'm healing you right now, so you don't have to learn anything. You just get your instant miracle and go on your way. No, it was, do not underestimate the power of complete healing. And I hung to that. And so it was, it's amazing because in that fortitude and in that journey, it's made me so much stronger. Those enemies, those demons are out of here. I've had some of them try to return and I say, get out. And they split instantly because they see the living Christ in me. You know, it's a, it's a journey of victory. 
It's a total journey of victory in the Lord. He gives us that and we walk with him, but we can't appropriate it unless the relationship and the love for him is number one. That's the biggest thing we have to do is get him number one in everything in our life. Amen. Amen. So Tina, this has been an amazing interview. Amazing. I'm sure everyone else online can agree. Now, if anyone wants to get prints of your artwork, where can they find it? And where can they bless your ministry? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have an art website and a page dedicated to it. Uh, it's tinaschmidt.com. Tina and then Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T.com. And uh, on that, there the, the, the watercolor page is there. And then there's a, a, a tab called Christian Themes. And that's where these uh, these paintings are and drawings. And then I have a, a ministry, uh, YouTube ministry that I've opened up recently in accordance to the timing of the Lord that he told me he wanted me to. And that is Kingdom Walker 24 seven. That's on YouTube. And then I have a regular um, art ministry, Tina Schmidt on YouTube. But, but the main thing really is Kingdom Walker 24 7 and i do post videos i post some of my encounters on there i post uh some things from my notes i think i remember telling you that um through all of this from 2019 to the present i've written like 16 volumes uh of notes that those questions when standing in the glory of jesus in 2015 those questions were all answered but I didn't have access to them until I aligned to him, made him number one, walked in the Lord and uh, stayed close to him. Then he began to open up the halls of, of, of the halls of knowledge, the halls of wisdom and all of that began to come back to me. And so and even now more revelations, I'm working on volume 17. So, yeah, those are I'm starting to put those some of those things that I've learned online, too. And are, is that going to become a book? Uh, the book, I, I cannot get 17 volumes in a book. So the book <laughs> is going to highlight certain things, but the book will really be kind of a, a way to, first of all, learn of what the power of walking with the Lord, his power to help you overcome every challenge, and also the, the way to overcome the enemy. Because we're doing battle here, but we're, we're really not quite understanding what the bat how to do battle in a way that is effective that it that it should be and i often inquired about this i asked the angels i asked god i says how do your angels do it how do they battle i've seen them battle the enemy how do they do that and have such amazing sweet and powerful but kind dispositions how do they not come out of that being barraggled and beat up and it's all about our relationship in the Lord. It's all about worship. It's all about praise. It's all about his glory and not about these licking our wounds over and over, you know? That's right. That is so right. All right, Tina. At the Thank end of you. every show, we always have the guests pray for the audience. And yeah. that's what I want oh. you to do. I okay. would like you to pray for those who are watching and are amazed by your testimony and say to myself, or to say to themselves, Lord, please let me have these close encounters with you. And I know it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So could you just pray for all these individuals who really want what you've experienced and who really want to know Jesus and want to know how to get there? So could you just please lift them up in prayer? Yes. Okay, I will. Thank you. Father God and Jesus, you are one. And we recognize you as one. We thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you for the day you have given us and all the good in it and the glory that we can give you of everything good that happens in our day. Lord, I'm praying right now, we come together to honor you. And we pray right now that people receive revelation and hope and grow in a new way, like Paul says, we become new, a new mind in Christ, a new being in Christ. And we pray for those strongholds of blindness to be broken off. We pray for the lies of the enemy to be broken off. 
we pray, Lord, for uh, people to have a deep and profound love to pursue you. So help them have that desire in their heart. I pray that you give them fortitude and courage and peace as they pursue you. I also pray, Lord, for giving them a spirit of discernment that they begin to become aware and awakened when they are not walking in alignment with you and your will. I pray that they come to understand and realize that you are there for them. Give them revelation of you being there for them always and help them break off the strongholds, the lies, the false voices of the enemy that continues to try to separate them from you. I pray that they develop a deep and profound trust for you and make you number one. And now I pray that you open the door of their heart, the eyes and ears of their heart, that they may hear and see all that you have in your heart of love for them. I pray for every one of them who now comes before you in honesty. I pray they develop a relationship with you and come before you with their sins, their confessions, their heavy heart, and bring it out all before you. And then trust you, Lord, to help them so that they can get rid of this, these problems that plague them and they can be uplifted and they can embrace all that you have to teach them. I pray that you encourage them in your word, which unlocks your presence that can be there in their life. I pray for each and every one of them that your love will overshadow them, that the power of your word will help them and that the eyes and ears of their heart will be unlocked and opened as they pursue you. I pray you give them strength and courage during the, the long dry seasons and that they are uplifted in you and praise you and bring you honor and glory um, as you help them and walk side by side with them. Give them the awareness that you have never left them, that the love you radiate out to them is eternal and that when they draw near to you, Lord, they'll have it. So I pray for this breakthrough. I pray for binding of the enemy and the blindness, uh, that it will um, be taken away and that they can have uh, the, their uh, desires with you to come true. Go before them and make the way clear. Set your armies of angels before them and make their way clear so that they can find you, Lord, and pursue you and to have that oneness with you. I pray that the fire in their heart will never die. You say you give us a cloak of zeal along with our armor, and uh, Lord, give them that zeal to always pursue you and to be close to you. I pray that so that the riches, the treasures, and the abundance that you have for each and every individual will become their victory and testimony on earth. In your mighty name, I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tina Schmidt, thank you so much for this interview. You're welcome. And it was my pleasure and my pleasure to glorify Jesus and all that he has and does for us is, is amazing. There's so much more behind the scenes we don't see, but what he shows us is enough uh, to bring him glory and to welcome in and herald his kingdom in on earth.